welcome to Flagler County Baptist Church. We're so glad you're here in the Lord's house tonight. There should be a hymn book in the seat pocket there in front of you, and you will find a song there entitled, Victory in Jesus, My Savior Forever, 341, 341. Let me invite you to stand with me as we sing together, Victory in Jesus, 341. Let's sing it together with all of our heart. Victory in Jesus, on the first verse together. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin One of it tell you what, we sure did have a good church service this morning. The Lord moved, and I'm so thankful for it. Good Sunday school hour and good crowd of people, and the Lord just continues to bless this church. I'm so thankful for it. I'm thankful for all that God has been doing here, and it's just fun to kind of watch, isn't it? You know, as God is just building and growing His church, and uh, what a blessing it is. But anyway, it's always good to have faithful people love the Lord and and so thank you so much for being here on Sunday night service. I'd ask if Brother Dave asked me, would you lift your voice there? Brother Silas will bring you a microphone so they can hear you on the Facebook. Mm -hmm. But if you'd lift your voice and pray and ask God's blessing on the service, please. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we thank you so much that we can be in your house this afternoon, dear God, and be up under your, uh, under the man of God's word, dear Father. He can bring the word that you put on his heart to his Father, and dear God. I just pray, Lord, that we can take in the message from this morning with Job, dear Lord, and Whatever the message is this evening, dear Lord, and just let us affect us, dear God, that we could be that witness for you in this world, dear Lord. Father, I just thank you so much just for loving us the way you do, dear God, and just thank you for this church and for our pastor, Lord. Thank you all for Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to be seated, and I want you to find in your hymn book, if you would, it may not match up here, but don't worry about that. It's 237, 237. This is a song we've never done here, and uh, it's a good song. And uh, it's kind of like a choir special song. And, uh, and so uh, I, I said, why not just let them sing like a mighty choir tonight? And the song is entitled, From the First Hallelujah to the Last Amen. I'll praise the Lord and then I'll praise Him again. It's talking about coming to church and praising the Lord when it starts all the way to when it finishes. But it's 237, From the First Hallelujah to the Last Amen. And uh, let me just see here. How many people say, I've heard this, I know this song? Oh, no, just three or four of us. All right, let's learn. It goes like this. Often in our reverent time we say amen. And when our hearts are joyful, hallelujahs ring again. In old camp meetings on the grass or temples built by men, a saint shouts hallelujah and we all join in. From the first hallelujah. Last amen. I'll praise the Lord and then I'll 
How many say it is kind of familiar? Maybe I've heard it before. A couple of you. Good. All right. It's a good one. And uh, like I said, it's kind of a choir song. So you'll be the choir. Pick a part. Have fun. Verse 2. Ready? We say hallelujah. That means praise our Lord. And amen simply tells us that our hearts are in accord. So if you feel restricted, strike a brand new chord. Let's all Hallelujah to the last Amen I'll praise the Lord And then I'll praise Him again Sharing the love of Jesus With all men From the first Hallelujah to the last Amen Oh, I like it, verse 3 Now don't you be embarrassed Now to say Amen And don't you ever sing one you know a little better, 174, 174, and uh, you did great, choir, I tell you what, faith is the victory, you'll know this one, 174 in your hymn book. to the last. Amen. All right. Well, if you need a bulletin, raise your hand. Brother Silas is back there, and he is rip-roaring and ready to go. He will bring you your certified COVID-free bulletin right to where you're sitting tonight. And uh, as you get those out, we'll go over a few different things that we need to be aware of and uh, all be faithful. There's a lot more things on the calendar than are on your bulletin. They're coming up here in the near future. We'll be talking about them, one of which is uh, we announced it uh, on Wednesday night, sort of. We didn't really have a, uh, a big unveiling, but we did talk about it Wednesday night. 
And that is a mission trip we're praying about going on. Not praying about it. We're praying about it, but we are going to go on it. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. And uh, we're going to be heading over to uh, New Mexico and uh, going to see Brother Chitty, Dr. Don Chitty out there and helping him with the Navajo Indians. And uh, that is going to be the last uh, week in July. And we'll end up leaving the Thursday before that flying. We're flying there, flying to Denver. I already spoke with Pastor Gary Randall in Denver, Colorado. He said we can borrow his bus, one of his buses, shuttle buses, and we'll drive into uh, to there, to New Mexico. That's the cheapest way to get there. It's a seven-hour drive from there, but it's still the cheapest way to get there. And uh, seven hours versus 30 hours seems a lot better to me. And, uh, and so we'll do that. And uh, it's going to be a blessing. It's going to be a good time. We're doing that with the teenagers. What we're going to be doing is we're going to have a missions trip uh, uh, slash teen camp. It's going to be a mixture of both. Uh, in the morning times, I've already spoken over all of this with Brother Chitty Jr., Don Chitty Jr. And, uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, camp in the morning. We'll, we'll get up in the morning, do our family, or I mean our, our, our personal devotions. And then we'll have a, a, a morning session of preaching and singing and all of that. Then we'll have some activities. And in the afternoon, we're going to go work with the Indians. We'll go try to win some to Christ. And, uh, and, and, uh, and we'll work on the reservation. And we'll even work on the camp there and do any odds and ends jobs that he has that he needs to get done. We'll help him with that. And then we'll come back in and we'll have some more uh, preaching and uh, more activities and things like that. It's just going to be a fun time. We're, we're mixing the two together. It'll be missions and teen camp all rolled into one. And I believe the Lord will, will tremendously bless that, no doubt about it. And uh, so we're planning on doing it, like I said, the last week in July. And if you'd like to go along and be a chaperone, see Brother Marco and, uh, and let us know. Uh, as it stands right now, the, the cost is going to be about $400 that include the ticket and the food while we're at camp. We will have to have some meals on the way and on the way in and on the way out there that will be in, in addition to that. But there will be some fundraisers that you'll see on your calendar here in the near future. And uh, we'll end up having another rummage sale here that seemed to work pretty well. Uh, we're also talking about having a spaghetti dinner uh, with a VIP table. We'll unveil that a little later on. And, um, and uh, what was the other thing we are going to do? You said selling CBD liquids or something? I'm just kidding. No, really, what was it? I don't remember. The other fundraiser. Brother Marco, do you? I can't remember now. There's three of them we're going to do. Oh, the workathon. The kids were going to uh, do a workathon here at the church and raise money to pressure wash and do all kinds of stuff and get people to sponsor them for that. So anyways, if you could be a part of that, if you want to be a part of that, see Brother Marco, that's coming up here in the near future. We've got all kinds of stuff coming up. It's exciting times to be a part of this church. But anyways, uh, let's look at some of the things we have going on this week. There is no FCBBI on Thursday night. We did move soul winning to Thursday night this week only. If you'd like to go with us, we're going out on follow-up visitation. What does that mean? means we're going to come here, we're going to spend some time in prayer, then we're going to leave and we're going to go visit people who have visited the church, people who've made decisions for Christ, people who need to be baptized. There's a whole list of reasons why we visit people. And uh, some of them are just people who visited the church and all they need is simply someone to deliver to them a gift from our church. We have a little jar and we put little candy stuff in it and a little gospel track and stuff. And all you simply got to do is just go to their home and, and say, here, this is from our church, our pastor, and we just want to say thank you so much for visiting the church. Hope to see you again soon. It's really very, very simple, like a UPS driver, or Uber Eats, or whatever you want to call yourself. And uh, so, anyways, we'll be doing that on Thursday night. No FCBBI this Thursday only. Uh, so instead, we're going to go visitation on Thursday night uh, uh, here at 6.30. So winning uh, here at 6.30. Anybody go to the Strawberry Festival this weekend? A few of you did, didn't you? I saw some of you there. It was an interesting. Pretty interesting place. I told Brother Jeremy when I saw him, I said, we should set up a booth here. And, uh, and take those jars that we have that say Flagler County Baptist and just simply put iced tea in it and give it away. Just give people glasses of iced tea because everything there is a fortune. And uh, the people will be mad at us for sure, uh, the other people that have booths and everything. But, uh, but nonetheless, we'll, uh, uh, I thought it would be a good idea. I said, next year we need to get on board with this thing and uh, give people some iced tea and some lemonade and stuff like that and, and, and give them obviously a gospel track. And I think we'll see people walking around all over the place with our, with our mugs in their hands. You know, it's something we need to pray about. Always looking for ways, uh, thinking outside of the box, ways to try to win people to Christ. Anyways, uh, here's what's coming up here. Uh, we have ladies' time out That's, uh, this Tuesday night at the Hobbs home. 
That's 5.30 p.m. If you need directions to the house, see my wife. She'll give you our address. You can come that way. I was sort of joking this morning when I said we have an online directory, and if you, don't, if you want a paper one, you know, uh, too bad. I'm only kidding. Brother Jeremy said that he can print a paper directory, right? You have the ability to do that? He believes so. If not, he will handwrite one for you and uh, just for you. He doesn't mind. He's got nothing else to do. And, uh, and so, <laughs> oh, speaking of you guys. Do you have something there for me? Should I do this? Do you really want to do that? You want me to do it or do you want to do it? Me? Why are you guys clapping? <laughs> Baby Natal's gender. I tell you what, if you come on Wednesday night, I will, I will open that up for you. All right, so also, what's that? You, I won't make it out of the building. I'll leave now. Thank you very much. Uh, so come Wednesday night. Uh, you th- do you really want me to open it now? <laughs> you guys are bad. You guys are really bad. All right. <laughs> open me, it says. I'm going to open it like where they can all see or just peek myself. Okay. Oh, I'm so happy for you guys. That's great. All right. <laughs> all right, play something so they know what it is. What can you think of? about, uh, I almost said it's raining men, but that would be bad. It's a girl. I'm just kidding. It's a girl. They're having another girl. Gracie's going to have a little sister. Isn't that great? Yay. All right. That's wonderful. We're happy for you guys. And uh, this means you have to try again. <laughs> That's great, man. Praise the Lord. Happy, happy you. All right. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. All right, well, let's look at a couple more things going on here. Youth activity, Pizza Panic on Friday, March the 26th. There's no charge for this activity at all. The kids are going to have a good time going house to house. Some of you raised your hand saying you will volunteer to help out with that. If you did raise your hand or if you want to volunteer and you didn't raise your hand, please see Brother Marco. He will get you involved in that. But try to be discreet. Brother Marco told me last time uh, teenagers were looking to see whose hands raised and see who went up to them and see who volunteered. And uh, so be a little discreet about it so that they do not know because they cannot know who has volunteered because uh, then it will give them clues. And, uh, and then he also told me that, that the girls cheated last time. Right. No. Mm. No. no. The boys cheated. The boys cheated last time. And, uh, and uh, they, were, they were going to the house and then they were waiting in the other car. When it, when it left the house and figured out where they are going, they just followed the car in front of them. And I'm like, that's cheating. And uh, leave it to girls to do something like that. But anyways, uh, was Erica driving the other car? No. Who was driving that car? <gasps> Brother. <laughs> Pastor Jim. All right. <clears throat> Pizza Panic, March the 26th. No charge for this activity. Easter Sunday schedule is going to be a great time. We are going to go to Malacampra Park at 7 a.m. for service and baptisms in the ocean. 8 a.m. will be breakfast right there at a home, just up the road from there, the house home. And, uh, and then uh, we'll all caravan back here to the church, uh, 500 North Pine, right here where you are right now, and uh, for our 10 a.m. Sunday school and 11 a.m. main church service, main Easter Sunday service. And so we'll look forward to seeing you uh, there for that. Uh, after uh, Easter Sunday uh, is when we're going to begin uh, discipleship. We're going to wait till Easter rolls through. And then after Easter Sunday rolls around, that next Sunday we'll begin discipleship where Sunday school class in the auditorium uh, will be me teaching discipleship. And I want everyone to come. I want you to, to learn the discipleship material, except for those who are in other classes, obviously. Uh, I want you to learn discipleship material because once you go through the discipleship class here, then I want you, and we'll help you. We'll put somebody with you. We'll pair you up with somebody. We want you to, to have somebody and disciple them somewhere else. And, uh, and go through that. And then I, I believe if we do this thing right, it'll be absolutely biblical. That's the Bible way of doing it. And the church will grow not only numerically, but most importantly, it'll grow spiritually. 
And uh, it's important to know what you believe, but you need to know why you believe what you believe. It's not good enough to just say, well, that's because that's what that preacher down there says. You need to know why you believe what you believe, and you need to be able to say, because this is what the Word of God teaches. And so that's what discipleship's all about. I hope you'll be praying about that and, uh, and help us out. We want everybody to be a part of that. Boy, I tell you what, we had a lot of birthdays that uh, we were recognizing this morning. Did we miss anybody? Was there another birthday of someone else? I thought someone told me there's another one this week. All right, who? Karen, I already said happy birthday to her. Brother Jacob. Oh, that's right. I knew there was somebody. There it is. So Don and Brian had a birthday. Karen Bowen had a birthday. And then Elizabeth, uh, this morning, she had a birthday, or is having a birthday. And then Brother Jacob Roth, we, you were, he was interpreting at another uh, a church and uh, uh, sign language. He's a sign language interpreter. If you know anybody that's deaf, you ought to invite him to come to church. We have built-in sign language interpreters now. I, I told my wife, I said, I'm excited because the Lord's going to bring us somebody deaf here soon. I said, because he's not going to give us this family without giving us a reason, you know, uh, uh, without giving us some souls there in that ministry. So I'm excited to see what the Lord's going to do. Brother Jacob, God bless you, my friend. Uh, what are you, 44 now? You will be, yeah, you will be 44. Are you, are you, you know, yeah, I just did the math you told me. I didn't really do the math. It was very simple. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, happy birthday to you. Let's sing to him. Are you ready? Happy birthday to you. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Back in Homestead, we had a man who was deaf, and I was going to surprise him and do the interpretation of happy birthday. And, uh, and so happy is, you know, the middle finger is always a finger of emotion. And uh, believe it or not. And, uh, and so happy is you point to your chest and you do like this. It's happy. You know, and then birthday? Not birthday? That's celebration. What's birthday? Happy birthday? Birthday? Okay, they did this. Happy birthday. Something like that. Anyways, so um, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, instead of putting my hands here, I had them here on the side. And I did like this. And apparently that's monkey birthday. And uh, so I want to wish you a monkey birthday. And uh, I would get in so much trouble. I can't even tell you how much trouble I got in trying to do sign language interpreting. I literally can't tell you. But, uh, but anyways, it was bad. But uh, I used to teach a Sunday school class in and, and, uh, and, and sign language, and, and I've lost it. It's been so long since I've done it. I can't wait to get some deaf people so I can get refreshed in the whole thing. But uh, anyways, God bless you. Happy birthday, Brother Roth. We're so glad the Lord brought you and your family uh, here to our church. What a blessing you guys have been already. And uh, those who clean the church, thank you so much. Cleaning ministry team A, uh, Miss Brittany, uh, Mrs. Aspen, Mrs. Kimmy, God bless you ladies. We sure appreciate you. And uh, the ladies, all the ladies have been doing such a wonderful job, and uh, we're so thankful for that. All right, well, I think that's all for the announcements. There's a, a chorus there. It's entitled, Everybody Ought to Know, Everybody Ought to Know Who Jesus Is. Let me get you to stand with me. Let's sing this song together. We'll greet one another tonight. Everybody ought to know. Ready? Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Do it again. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know.
these young men are going to sing for you, and uh, you'll love the song. I know you know the song, but let's uh, let the Lord use it to get our hearts prepared for the preaching of the Word of God tonight. I turned it off. Now I turned it on. All right. Did they not hear anything the whole first part of the service? Let's start over. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for coming tonight. Take your hymn books out. All right. Well, First Peter in chapter number four, and uh, we are continuing the message that we started last Sunday night. And for those who are watching by way of the internet, whether it be Facebook or Vimeo or whatever way you're watching us tonight, uh, I'll tell you that um, uh, that will be reposted here soon, and uh, some of the guys in our, in our sound board and our, 
our, our audio-visual ministry are working diligently to get that one edited and get it posted for you. There were several people who had asked about it and wanted to be able to share it with others, and so we're trying to get that one up and running for you. But we're going to carry on tonight with part two of Life in the Last Days. And we are looking in our scripture in the book of 1 Peter in chapter number 4. And uh, we're going to begin reading in verse number 7. As is our custom, I would invite you to stand with me, please, out of respect for your Bible. If you do not have a copy of the Word of God and you would like to follow along with us, there are some there on the back table. And uh, you're more than welcome to just sneak back there and go grab one uh, if you'd like to grab one for this evening. 1 Peter in chapter number 4, beginning with verse number 7. The Bible says these words. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift of Even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it uh, as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, my Father, I need thee every hour, but especially now. I pray, dear Lord, as I stand before you, just your humble servant, I pray, dear Lord, that you'll do what I humanly cannot do, and that is to speak to the hearts of people. I also request of you, Lord, that you'll fill me with the Holy Spirit, that I might be able to preach your word with the power of thus saith the Lord. I pray, Father, that in the next few moments you'll use this message to speak to the hearts of those who may be watching uh, here tonight and those who are watching abroad. Father, use it for your glory. We ask it all in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Thank you for standing. Please be seated. We talked about last time we were together how the Bible said there in our text, but the end in verse number seven, but the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. You may say, but wait a minute, Peter, or or Lord, uh, preacher, wait a minute, I'll get it. Wait a minute, preacher. Peter is the one who wrote this, and he wrote this uh, almost 2,000 years ago. He wrote verse 7 through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but the end of all things is at hand. You may say, preacher, was Peter wrong? He said the end of all things is at hand, and it's been nearly 2,000 years since Peter penned these words down. I guess Peter must have been wrong, and I say, oh no, absolutely not. If you know your Bible, you'll know that that the end times, you say, when did the end times begin? Uh, We began living in the last days uh, immediately after Pentecost. Immediately after Pentecost, we began living in the last days. We talked about uh, the different evidences of this when we were together. Uh, we, we, we looked at Acts 2.17 on the day of Pentecost. Uh, Peter described what was happening uh, on that day, and he wrote these words, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. And that's what happened on Pentecost. And he said these will happen in the last days. Paul said these words in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul said for us here, talking to the Corinthians, he said the end of the world has come to us. Now, why would Peter say that, that we are in these last days? He said the end of all things is at hand. Why would Paul say that these things happen uh, to those uh, uh, Old Testament saints there as examples, and they're written for our admonition, for whom the ends of the world are come? Why would they say these things? This might be what Paul meant in Philippians 4 and verse 5 when he said the Lord is at hand. It might have been what James meant. When James said in James 5 and verse number 8, the judge standeth at the door. It might have been what John meant when John said in 1 John 2.18, little children, it is the last 
time. I'm just trying to tell you tonight that these, old, uh, these New Testament writers of the Bible, they were living in the last days because the last days began immediately after Pentecost. We have been living in the last days. Now today, I would say we're not just living in the last days. We're, we're not just living in the last hours. We are living not even in the last minutes. We are living in the last seconds. The Lord's coming certainly is at hand. And so based upon the fact that we are where we are today, when you look at how it seems as though God does every major event in 2,000 year increments, and we talk about you have creation, and 2,000 years later you have a massive flood, and, and, uh, and 2,000 years later you have the Lord Jesus Christ, and 2,000 years later you have you and I here, right here this evening. Uh, God does things in these 2,000 year increments uh, uh, and he is a God of order, so I reckon we might be pretty close to what God has next planned on his calendar. It just makes a whole lot of sense. You couple that with everything that we see around us, uh, the revival and apostasy. You look at, uh, at, at what's going on in and around churches. You look what's going on in and around our world. Uh, you look at the, mor the morals of society as they are plummeting straight to hell. And you say, certainly we have to be living in the last days. You look at other signs of the times. You look at uh, pestilence and diseases. And, and did you ever think you'd live in a world where people would, would force you to wear a mask everywhere you go? You know, I'm wearing these glasses tonight, and I don't like them, but I kind of have to wear them. I see you a lot better, and I see the looks you're giving me now, and you're not liking them. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, but as I was in the glasses shop the other day, uh, it was yesterday, to try these on, um, I, I pulled the mask down below my nose because my, it kept fogging them up, and she said, see if you like this, see if you can see with these glasses. And so I put them on, and immediately they're fogged. And so I pulled the thing below my nose because I needed the fog to go away so I could see if these things worked. And she said, excuse me, sir, we require, immediately, excuse me, sir, we require that the mask be put on over your nose. And I said, well, ma'am, you just asked me to see if they work. I said, I don't wear glasses. I said, how do I, how do I, how do I make the fog stop, you know? I said, how can I tell if they work? And she says, well, I just need, you just need to know, you got to have it over your nose. And I said, you know, why don't you just check me out so I can leave? I said, I don't like it here at all. I said, I want to just go. And, uh, and so they gave me uh, my other set of glasses, the readers, you know. And so I put them on real quick, and I took them off, and I said, they're fine, you know. And when I took them off, the lens fell on the ground. And, uh, and I said, what's the deal with this, you know. I said, I didn't break them. I just took them off. And, uh, and so then she said, let me get you new frames. And she tried all that. And she said, well, it's not the frame. It's the lens. i got to send them back. And I said, does this mean I have to come back here? And, uh, and she said, no. I said, I don't want to come back here ever again. I told her. I said, can my wife just go get these so I don't ever have to come here again? And she said, sure, she can. You can't have them fitted or whatever, but she can just get them. I said, let's just do that and let me just leave, you know. And uh, I, I, it, it drives me crazy. Now, I wouldn't tell you the name of the business because I wouldn't want to hurt America's finest uh, at all. Uh, they're located in the, in, the, in the Target Town Center there. I wouldn't want to hurt them. They're a new business. But nonetheless, would you ever think that you'd live in a world where you're forced to wear a mask everywhere you go? I watched a lady yesterday, last night, this video that I, I saw, this lady was in Bank of America, and she said, I just want to withdraw my money. And they said, put on your mask or you're going to jail. Here in America, cop came in there, and, uh, and she said, I just want to get my money out of here. I just want to get my money out, and I'll never bother you folks again. And the cop said, they have rules. You put on the mask or you leave the facility. And she says, I want to breathe. Can I just withdraw all of my money and they'll never see me again? And, and he says, nope. He said, we'll just do this the hard way then. Takes a 65-year-old woman down to the ground and hurts her and arrests her, throws her in a car. In Texas, you know, God bless Texas. Threw her in a car and arrested her. You know, this stuff is, did you ever think you'd live in a world where you'd be arrested for not wearing a mask, you know? For not having the mark, you'll be killed for it one of these days. It's all conditioning us. But this is the day and age in which we live. 
And so there's no doubt. I, I, I said when we came into this last time, when we were here together, I said there's really no need for me to, to try to preach a sermon to convey to you that we are living in the last days. I don't know uh, of any believer that does not believe that we are living in the last days. Every Christian I speak to believes certainly we're living in the last days. Even lost people look at this and say something's not right, something's awry, something's amiss. Even lost people can tell there's something not right about this. You know, somebody sent me a picture of, of somebody wearing a full bubble suit walking into Walmart. They were serious. You know, I mean to tell you, watch people go down the street by themselves in their car wearing double masks. Now I'm just going on pet peeves. We're living in a crazy, crazy society, a crazy world. What should we be doing? If we realize we're living in the last days, and I think we all do, what does it say in verse number seven? But the end of, the, but the end of all times, I'm sorry, but the end of all things is at hand. It says there be ye therefore sober. We talked about that last time. We talked about that word sober means to be learning. We said that word that was used for sober was the same word that you find uh, over in the book of Mark where you find the, the Gadarean maniac. And, and when they found the Gadarean maniac, who was, he would always be naked and ripping off his cords and living in the tombs. And, but when he, when he met Jesus, everything changed. And then when they found him again, he was clothed. Uh, isn't that funny? When someone gets right with God, they put their clothes on. He was clothed. Uh, and in his right mind, the Bible says. And that's the same word we use here for sober-minded in our text. When it said there, be, be therefore sober, or be in your right mind. We said we need to have the right mind. And the, and, 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 and the second coming of the Lord, the rapture of the church, it helps us to understand things uh, that we would not understand if it were not for the second coming. These things would not make sense. When we were together last, we looked at, at, at Daniel's prophecy of the, of, the, of the golden head and the silver uh, arms and, and, and chest and the brass uh, midsection and the, and the legs that were made of iron and the feet that were iron with clay, and we said, if it weren't for the second coming of the Lord, if we didn't believe in it, none of this would make sense, but we understand now, and Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't understand all the way back then, he was the very first world empire. Each body part represented, uh, or each portion represented another world empire. And we looked at that head of gold being Babylon. And we looked at that center section, the arms and the chest uh, being made of silver. And that was the Medo-Persian Empire. And we looked at the brass midsection here. And that was a, a picture of the Grecian uh, Empire. And then we looked at the legs. And then we said there's two divisions of the legs. And certainly there was in Rome. Uh, with the Roman Empire, you had Byzantium and you had Constantinople. And they made up this one Roman, one world empire. There's going to be one more world empire that will come on the scene. This last world empire, there hasn't been a world empire since Rome. Those are the only world empires. It's perfect. The Bible's perfect. It's unbelievable. And so as you look at the prophecy all the way back in Nebuchadnezzar's time, the first, the head of gold, the very first world empire, there were several since then. And uh, there was the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman. And, and now there will be one more. And that, that empire will be the one world empire empire headed up by the antichrist himself and it will be iron mingled with clay and we talked about the iron the only element from that body that's left over no gold no silver no brass but iron what's the iron that was rome there's nothing left of rome not one rock sat upon another only thing left of rome was their religion roman catholicism is all that's left of rome and then when we were together last sunday it just so happened as we were talking about this, the Pope himself was in Iraq. Where, what is that? Ancient Babylon. The Pope was in Babylon. Uh, I mean to tell you. And then we looked at Revelation 17. We, 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 saw, we saw the Pope in Babylon. We saw the iron mingled, mingling last Sunday. Literally, the iron was mingling with clay, with Islam. That's what I believe the clay to be. You can have your own opinion on that. But nonetheless, where was he at? Babylon. Babylon. Am I the only one hearing something? Is it music from the house next door? Is it? Would you go ask them to do me a favor and turn that down? Tell them I'll preach louder if they want to turn it down a little bit and they can listen to us instead. But uh, that'd be great. But uh, unless it's good music, we'll just stop and listen to it. 
So, so we, we looked at that and we said, well, what in the world are the, are the, are the feet? It's the iron mingled with clay. And we said, that's Babylon. Where was the Pope just last Sunday night? He was in ancient Babylon, Iraq. And then we went to Revelation 17, and the Bible says, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. And we read through that, and we looked at how most undoubtedly that is a description of the Roman Catholic Church. And if you don't believe me, just go look at uh, the Council of Trent. And, oh, it's unbelievable, you know. We looked at history. We talked about a few different things. Israel becoming a nation. I believe we talked about that and United Nations and all of these things. History makes sense in light of the second coming of Christ. Science is not the answer. We talked about that. People think that science is going to bring us to a perfect utopia. And we said science is what's gotten us into the mess that we're in. Not good science, but bad science is what's gotten us into the mess that we are in. And we talked about how our head and our hands have outrun our hearts. And here we are. We've invented so many things that we can't even extradite ourselves from our own devices. And people are walking around and they're sucked into their devices every which way from Sunday. It is changing our society as we know it to the point where now there are people, I believe, who wear their masks not because they're worried about a virus, but because they just want to be left alone, and they want to fall into the shadows, and they want to become incognito, and they've been in their phones and their devices and their tablets for so long, and they have been out of withdrawn from society, and they kind of like it that way. And so they say, let me just wear this and I can further withdraw myself. I can fade into the hedges and everybody will just leave me alone. I say, well, a lot of good that's done for soul winning. Can't hardly talk to people anymore. They don't want to talk to you. They're looking the other way. We said social reform is not the answer. We're all for jobs. Everybody's for jobs, and we think that we ought to have that, but I'll remind you that a good economy is not the answer. Everybody's for education. That's what they say. This is what this world needs. They just need to be educated. You ask the world, and they say all of our problems are an education problem. If we could just get better schools over here, then that would solve the problems over here. And their answer to everything, have you noticed? Their answer to everything is education. They, that's the reason why they're robbing or stealing or doing this or doing that. They just need better education. If we could just get better education, and they have programmed us to believe that the answer is education to all of our social woes. And I will remind you this. They're saying, send your kids to our school where we will program your children with new morals, or yay, bad or no morals, uh, where, the, where we will tell them, don't you misgender somebody. Uh, don't you this, that. We're going to program your children. So the answer to fixing society's woes is let us have your kids for a little bit. And I say, I hope we're getting the picture that that didn't work. And it's not just at an elemental level, work our way all the way up to college. You know, all the hippies from the 60s and 70s have been the ones who hid from the war teaching in college and teaching our children all kinds of damnable heresies. You know, that's the answer, isn't it? Education. Oh, it's education. You see, we think if we just build a playground and get better education, we're going to fix society. And I say the only one who can fix it is Jesus. It's a heart problem, not a head problem. You know, uh, we're, we're, we're painting a, a, a boat that is sinking. The paint is not going to help the boat stop sinking, but it sure does distract everybody on board, doesn't it? You know, we should be, we should be looking for his coming. We talked about that. The Bible said that we're to be looking for his coming, and uh, we, we don't have time. Let me just move on. We should be longing for his coming. We talked about how we were supposed to pray. We're to be praying and longing for his coming, looking for and hastening unto the coming of the Lord. Second Peter 2, uh, 3, chapter 3, and verse number 12 says, uh, the Bible teaches us when we pray, the Lord said, uh, pray this way, uh, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. We're literally supposed to be praying for God to expedite the rapture of the church. We're supposed to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. We know the only time Jerusalem is ever, ever going to have peace is when the, uh, the Antichrist comes and brings peace for them. 
You know, so what are we saying? We're saying, even so, Lord, come. We look at the last prayer in the Bible, John on the Isle of Patmos. He wrote in Revelation 22 and verse number 20, he said, even so, come, Lord Jesus. The very last prayer recorded in the Bible was a prayer for the Lord to come soon. We're supposed to be longing for the coming of the Lord to the point we're actually praying for God to expedite it as his children. We're to be loving, and this is where we are tonight, we're to be loving at his coming. When he finds us, he ought to find our hearts filled with love or charity. Verse number seven, but the end of, t- of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things, notice that please, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Life in the last days, looking, longing, but loving at his coming. The Bible said, therefore, the love for love shall cover the multitude of sins. Now, it's interesting that Simon people Uh, Simon Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would say, above all, have love. Above everything else, you need to have love. In light of the last days, you need to have love. Why, Why, in the last days, above all things, should we have love? Because in the last days, things are going to get so lawless that if we're not careful we will become loveless. He says, above all things, you need to have agape love because because of the tidal wave of lawlessness, there is going to be many people who become loveless. There will be a tidal wave of crime. We look around us and all the time. They said it was the anniversary of of somebody's, somebody's death, Breonna Taylor. So they said there were riots again all over the United States again. You know, every time you turn around, more riots, more riots, cities being burnt. I mean, people, people infiltrating prisons. I mean, uh, 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 police uh, uh, precincts, literally going into police precincts. The police officers getting in their cars and driving through the gates and getting out of Dodge and then them setting police precincts on fire, you know. And then you got a, a chorus of politicians who are saying, we need to defund the police, and, and, and this isn't going to stop until, uh, until we have some social reform here, and, and, and we're, we're going we're gonna to bail them out of jail, these, these, these people who are committing crimes. You ever think you'd see that? People actually get voted in as vice president, if you in fact actually did get voted in, but you funded and helped pay to get people out of prison and jail who were committing crimes against our country. This is where we're living today. It's lawlessness. You know what it does? It makes those who love righteousness mad. It gives us what's called righteous indignation. But if we're not careful, that anger will turn into hatred. That's why he said in the last days, above all, above all, he said, have charity. There's going to be a tidal wave of crime. There'll be a tidal wave of immorality. An absolute tidal wave of immorality as we, as we look at this world around us. You'd say, well, how many, how many, what percentage of people in the United States of America claim to be LGBTQ? You know, and all the other letters, whatever it may be. And I say, well, according to the stats I read, 2%. You say, it seems like a lot more than that. Well, when you go by age range and you work your way down, it's not very many in the older segment. And then it starts to get a little bit more a little bit more, until finally you get to this young generation that's here right now, the the ones who are teenagers today, children today. 15%, 15% identify as LGBTQ. What's happening? It's a tidal wave of immorality in our country. And for those who love righteousness, it makes them sick. For those who love the Lord and they love the Word of God, you say, well, what do you mean it makes you sick? Why does it make you sick? Because it makes God sick. And I have the mind of God. And when you have the mind of God, what makes God sick makes you sick. Well, who, what do you mean it makes God sick? God calls it an abomination. 
When a man wears that which pertaineth to a woman, transgendered, or a woman wears that which pertaineth to a man, transgendered the other direction, the Bible says it is an abomination. The word abomination uh, has to, to do with a putrefying smell, something that nauseating, something that makes God sick. It literally makes God sick. No other way around it. Somebody could try to justify it, and, and I drove by a church, a Unitarian church in Fort Myers the other day, and they had a big rainbow flag out front, and it said, all are welcome, and all of this stuff, and, and certainly people are welcome. We want people to be saved, and, and all of that. We try to lead people to Christ, but, 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 but to, to try to justify it and act like that it's, there's nothing wrong with it, I, I, I'm thinking, what Bible are you reading? What Bible do you have? Uh, do you know the Bible? And more importantly, do you even know the God of the Bible? When you know the God of the Bible and you know the Word of God and you find out these things are called an abomination and you find out that, that these things are on the road to being a reprobate and you find out that it makes God sick, then it makes you sick. But if you're not careful, you'll take that anger and that, 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 that abominable sickness and you will transfer it uh, into hatred. And we'll go from lawlessness to lovelessness. And that's why he said in the last days, above, all, above everything else, have charity, have love. Love people. Listen, yes, these things are vile, they're sick, they're wicked, they're disgusting, they're abominable, they're putrefying. But God still loves that person and you should still love that person. So should I. May God help us to have the love that we are supposed to have for this lost and dying world. It doesn't matter what sins they are involved in. We're still supposed to love them. Let me tell you a few things about love. And by the way, because of great lawlessness, there's great lovelessness. There's so much lawlessness today that we're suspicious of everybody. All of us. We've almost got to the point of schizophrenia. We double lock our doors, alarms, and everything like that. We're worried about everybody. We have a hard time trusting anybody. And Peter is saying to us, don't let it get to you. Don't let it get to the place. Don't let the devil keep you from loving in these last days. You have to guard your heart with all diligence. Oh, if we learn nothing else from this, learn this tonight. Guard your heart. I get it. These things make us mad. We get angry when we think that our vote was just tossed out, meant nothing, you know. These things make you mad. Next thing you know, that anger turns into hatred. And the Lord said, in the last days, above all things, you have to have charity. This is, this, let me tell you about charity real quick. Real quick, it's interesting, this thing of charity or this thing of love in action. Did you know that love is the greatest, greatest characteristic? Look in your Bible real quickly. And uh, for those of you who, who, uh, who are preachers, you ought to maybe write this down in the margin of your Bible. This is a good sermon to preach one day, but I'm just going to give it to you fast. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 13, love is the greatest characteristic. The Bible says, and now abideth faith, hope, and char faith, hope, charity. They're good names for your kid. Faith, hope, and charity. I like it. Have three of them. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. We find out from the scripture there that the greatest characteristic that any Christian can have in his or her life is the characteristic or the quality of love, the virtue of love. These three abideth. What is the greatest? The greatest of love is love. He says it'd be better for you to have uh, more love than you have faith or more love than you have hope. You ought to have love. It ought to abound greater than the rest of them. What is the greatest characteristic? Love. What is the greatest commandment? Matthew 22, quickly, Matthew 22, the greatest commandment is found in Matthew, chapter number 22. So we see the greatest characteristic, love. What is the greatest commandment? Matthew 22 and verse number 36. The Bible says, Master, which is 
the great commandment in the law. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What's the greatest commandment? The greatest commandment is love. So the greatest characteristic that we ought to have is love. The greatest commandment is love. What is the greatest cooperation to your life? The greatest cooperation to your testimony? John 13. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 13. If you look at John chapter 13, and then look with me, if you would, please, at, uh, at, at verse number 35. In John 13, 35, the Bible says, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. The greatest characteristic you should have, love. The greatest commandment in the Bible, love. The greatest cooperation or, or testimony of your life ought to be defined by love. What is the greatest cause? What it should be the cause that you teach that Sunday school class? What should be the cause that you tithe and sacrificially give above and beyond the tithe? What is the greatest cause that you should be faithful to church? What is the greatest cause that you ought to come Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night? What is the greatest cause? What is the greatest motivation? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, For the love of Christ constraineth us. What is the cause of which we serve? It's not because I'm afraid of the preacher. It's not because I'm trying to build a name for myself. It's not because we're, we're hoping to impress somebody else. Why are we faithful in the things of God? The greatest cause for what we, why we do what we do should be love. We find out the greatest characteristic, love. The greatest commandment, love. The greatest cooperation to your testimony, love. The greatest cause, love. What is the greatest confirmation? 1 John, do you know where that's at? 1 John chapter 3. And 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 14. 1 John three fourteen. We know the greatest confirmation. Are you ready? We know that we have passed from death unto life. How do, you, how do you have the assurance of your salvation? What is the greatest thing that can give you the assurance of your salvation? We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. My friend, if your heart is a headquarters for hate, then you need to be saved. Don't, don't, don't have a heart that is a headquarters for hatred and pretend as though you're a child of God. That's, that's, that's not Pastor Hobbs. That's what the Bible just taught. Did you read it? I'll read it for you again. It said it right there in, 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 in verse number of, uh, of 314, John 314. It says, we know that we have passed from death unto life. Because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. That's the greatest confirmation that you're even saved. You see the greatest characteristic, the greatest cooperation of your testimony, the greatest cause for service, the greatest confirmation of salvation is the fact that we have love. And what kind of love is he talking about? Well, back in our text, what is he saying? He says, but the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch in a prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity. What kind of love should it be? He says, fervent charity. If you look up that word fervent, it's a very interesting word. It means stretched out. A stretched out charity or love in action. Charity being an agape love. He said have a stretched out agape love. Now what is stretched out? That has to do with a, 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 
a physical uh, race that you're running or some physical extraneous activity where you are stretching yourself to the limit. You're, you're stretching your body to the limit. That's what he's talking about. He's saying that we ought to have a love that is stretched out like an athlete who's stretching his muscles uh, to, their, to, their, to their limit so that he can reach the finish line. And if you have an athlete who's maybe somebody who's working out in the gym or whatever, anyone who works out knows this phrase. I'm about to say, no pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. What Peter is saying here is he's saying there's no such thing as a cheap love. Genuine love is fervent. Genuine love stretches you. Genuine love brings you further than what you thought you could go. A love that cost. That's what kind of love we're to have in the last days. A love that cost. Let me show you another thing. We're supposed to have a love that covers. What did he say there in verse number 8? Above all these things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. First of all, your love ought to cost you something, or it's cheap. To say you love somebody, but you're not willing to invest in them, talk is cheap. You know, talk is cheap. Don't tell someone you love them, show them that you love them. You know, talk is cheap. A love that costs something, but also a love that covers, he said. He said, above all, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs 10, 12? It says, hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. He's quoting the Bible. Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. You know what hatred does? Hatred takes joy in exposing the weaknesses of others. That person who loves to make fun of people and their weaknesses is only exposing hatred. True love does not take joy in exposing the weaknesses of others. May God help us, all of us, to be careful. We like to find people's weaknesses. It's our nature, our sin nature. We focus on the negative instead of trying to focus on the positive in people's lives. We like to expose that. These people who, who live in hatred, they gather up all the bad. They go around picking off all the scabs on people's lives, those, those sores that were once there that are, that are starting to heal, and they like to, to go there and grab them and pull those scabs back off again and reveal the wound that's there and re-injure that person instead of, instead of trying to help them, instead of being the salve, instead of bringing the ointment. They say, I want to re-injure this person when they find a uh, 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 somebody's weakness or somebody's downfall, they find great delight in exposing that person. Their joy is found in, in, in drawing attention and bringing as many people around as they can and saying, look at this person. Look at how messed up they are. Look at what they've done. That is not love. The Bible says love covers. Love doesn't just try to manifest somebody's faults and failures. Love covereth. the Bible says. The way it should be. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Rejoiceth not in iniquity. Love doesn't wish ill on people. Love wants the best for people. Love tries to cover things up. Noah came out of the ark. And what did he do? First thing he did was he got drunk. And what happened? His son Ham saw his nakedness. And what did Ham do? He went around and he tried to expose it to everybody. What did he do? Ham, Ham saw his father's nakedness. He saw his father in his drunken condition, and nobody is condoning drinking at all. No one's saying that, 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 that Noah should have done that. Noah was a sinner just like you and I. You know, you look at Noah, and, 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 and he's the only righteous man, but the first thing he does is he gets drunk. Imagine how bad the world was before Noah, you know. Uh, before, the, before the great flood. 
But Ham came and he saw his father's nakedness and he saw his father was in his drunken condition and he was so quick to run and tell others about it. He was so quick to run and spread the news. He was so quick to stir it up. He wanted to stir up the bad news and make sure that everybody else knew about it. But thankfully he had two other sons, Shem and Japheth. And what did Shem and Japheth do? The Bible tells us that Shem and Japheth, they, they heard of this and so they went to their father and they walked backwards with a covering. They walked backwards to their father and they took the covering and they covered up their father's nakedness. They covered up their father's shame. They covered up their father's period of shame in his life. They were not condoning what their father had done, but they were simply covering what their father had done. And the world would be a better place. I mean to tell you it would be a much better place if people would not rejoice in iniquity, but rather they would try to help cover up iniquity. My wife sings this song around the house. She sings, let me be a little kinder, let me be a little blinder to the faults of those around me, let me praise a little more. And I've never heard that till I married her, it's probably contemporary knowing her it is, but but I, uh, I heard that and I said, that's good lyrics. Let me be a little blinder. Let me be a little kinder to the faults of those around me. Let me love a little more, you know. No one sang that, that, that we're to cover up sin and try to, try to, try to sweep something under the rug. We're, we're, we're simply talking about covering somebody's shame, somebody's embarrassment, Instead of rejoicing in it, instead of, instead, of, uh, instead of seeing a brother that is overtaken with a fault and, and saying, hey everyone, look at this person, look what they've done, they're overtaken with a fault, look at, look at daddy, he got drunk, look at daddy, he's exposing his negatives, hey, hey, look at this person over here, they're, they're busted, they're caught, they're overtaken with a fault. Instead of doing that, if, your bro- if you see a brother overtaken with a fault, the Bible says, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one with a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. We're supposed to help cover, help people. How about a love that considers? A love that considers. In verse number nine, what does he say? Use hospitality one to another without grudging. A love that considers others. What kind of, how are we supposed to live in the last days? Supposed to be people of love, great love, above all, love. Why? Why? Because in the last days, there's going to be so much lawlessness that there will probably be lovelessness amongst God's people. We're going to be so sickened by how wicked this world's becoming that we're going to allow the lawlessness to, 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 to plant hatred in our hearts. And he says, don't let it happen. Above everything, have love. And it's a love that considers, a love that considers others. Recently, very recently, I invited somebody to preach for us and Brother Arthur had to go do a, a funeral for a lady in his church. And, and let me just speak a word on that if I could. Brother Arthur's secretary of many years passed away. And, and I love a man who says, look, I travel around and preach everywhere. He said, because people are calling me and asking me to, and I feel like that's what God wants me to do. And he said, you wouldn't have any idea how many people say that I'm not a good pastor or whatever, because how can I be a pastor of my church and be flying around preaching everywhere? And he says, but I just feel that's what God wants me to do. But if, if you've ever spent any time with him like I have, you will see he's always, always on the phone talking to his assistant pastor, saying, go here, visit this person, visit that person. He's just constantly moving pieces around and saying, take care of this, take care of that. And then when this lady passed away, you know, he, he calls up the funeral home. He, he, he says, he called the family and said, what funeral home are you using? She t- they told him. He called up the funeral home and he said, when are you going to pick up her body? And they told him, we're going at about midnight, one o'clock in the morning. He said, I'm on my way. I want to ride with you. And he went with the funeral director. His church doesn't know. Nobody knows. You know. But he got in the car and he went with his, the funeral director because he wanted to be there for this woman. You know, I look at people like that and I say, I hope I have that kind of love for people, especially in these last days. It's a love that considers. 
So I had to find somebody to replace Brother Arthur because he was going to preach that the, 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 the Thursday and the Friday, I believe it was, and he was going to miss, or the Wednesday and the Friday, he was going to miss the Thursday. And so I, I contacted a preacher, and I said, hey, I, I know that you're here around and, and uh, an evangelist and everything, and, and would, you, would you consider coming over and preaching that one day while Brother Arthur is gone and he won't be able to preach? And, 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 and he responded to me, and, and he said in a text message, he said, these words, what do you normally spend for a suite or rooms for a family? What hotel do you use? And that was the response. What do you normally spend on a hotel, on a suite, on a suite is specific? And what hotel do you use? I read that and I thought, I wouldn't have you preach for me. I wouldn't have you preach for me. You know, what do you mean? What kind of hotel do I use? You know? Let me tell you something. Shame on him for sending that, but shame on all the other churches that have put him up in some of the probably worst places in the world that he even feels like he has to send that out. You know what I mean? That's not right. You know? Oh, how you, we ought to take care of God's man. I've, I've preached out many times. And I went to a, man, I've been to churches where my wife will tell you, we went to one church, I didn't even know these people. And, and they, 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 in the hotel room, they put us up in this big suite in Hampton, and they had, they had a, a, a basket bigger than this flower, way bigger, this is as big, big as this table, you know? And they called us up on the platform, my whole family, and, and they gave every one of them gift cards and, and gave me gift cards. I mean, they just showered us, and they said, when somebody preaches here, they leave here knowing that we love evangelists and preachers and all that stuff, and we were overwhelmed. Now, I think they went a little overboard because I'm nobody, but I was thankful for it, you know? But I'll tell you this much, I'd rather it be that than someone stick, stick a preacher down in some basement cellar where there's rats and roaches and things like that running around, like here. Just kidding. It's a shame, isn't it? We have a great desire to be doctrinally pure. You say, what's your great desire for this church? My great desire for your church here is that it be doctrinally pure but I don't want it to be one of those cantankerous type of churches where the people try to f find faults in everybody and everything. We have to be careful. For some reason, it seems as though if you want to be doctrinally pure, that means you also have to be mean and cantankerous. And I say it doesn't have to be that way. Why can't we be doctrinally pure and have love? It seems like today there are only two Baptist churches that you can choose from when you're looking for those that are independent Baptists. It seems like today there's only two Baptist churches to choose from. Doesn't have to be independent. Just two Baptist churches. Either you have one that is truthless love. They have love, but they don't have truth. They have a truthless love. And they love, no doubt. You go there and they just shower you with love. But they have no truth, or you have a loveless truth. And those are your two choices. You can go to the church that has loveless. They, they don't love anybody, but they have truth. And they preach the Word of God, and you know, they stand firm on the Word of God, and they have truth, and you can sit there and go, Amen, Amen, and you love the truth, but they don't have love. And then you have another church who has love, but they don't have truth. Oh, it shouldn't be that way. We should have truth and love, not a truthless love and not a loveless truth, but we should speak the truth in love. Oh, now, we should be laboring until he comes. Verse number 10, quickly, as every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We're supposed to be good stewards or managers of what? Of the manifold grace of God. That word's interesting. Manifold grace has to do with multicolored or the rainbow of God's grace. We are supposed to be good stewards of the beautiful spectrum of the graces of God. We're to occupy till he comes. People think that word occupy means to just take up a space. And I say, understand this. It's talking about an occupation. Occupy till I come means have an occupation or work. Uh, we should be uh, good stewards of the manifold, the, the multicolored spectrum of God's graces. We should occupy. We should be working uh, at giving out the graces of God. I like that song that says, we'll work till Jesus comes and then we'll be gathered home. He tells us, as every man has received a gift, so minister the same one to another. 
There are two gifts. There's a speaking gift and there's a serving gift. When you speak, you ought to speak as the oracles of God. That's what it says there. Speak as the oracles of God. Do not speak out of your own well, but speak as the oracles of God. That ought to be everywhere. That, this, shouldn't, this shouldn't be that it's hard to find a church that preaches, thus saith the Lord. But it's difficult to find a church that preaches, as thus saith the Lord, the oracles of God. This is what God says. But he didn't just talk about speaking as the oracles of God. He talked about serving. He said, if any man speak, verse 11, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister or serve, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. He says, you ought to speak under the power of God as the oracles of God. You ought to serve under the power of God. He speaks of serving gifts. Not everybody can stand in a pulpit and preach. But thank God for those who are in the sound room. Thank God for those who run cameras. Thank God for those who work on bus routes. Thank God for those who greet. Thank God for Sunday school teachers. Thank God for those who serve in junior church and in King's Kids and bus ministry. All those different things. We ought to be speaking as the oracles of God, but we ought to be serving under the power of God also, not in your own strength. All of the teaching, preaching, praying, praising, singing, it ought to be done with the glory of God upon it. All of the work, all of the serving, all of the giving, all of the lifting, all of the helping and the sharing and the guiding, and all of this is to be done not in the strength of our own flesh, not like we'd run Hollywood or some other organization, General Motors or Wall Street, but, ought, but it ought to be run with a supernatural infusion, a supernatural grace, and a strength as God has given us to administer all of the spiritual gifts. Now here's the bottom line of it all. What does he say? If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability of which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified. That is the bottom line of all bottom lines, that God may be glorified. That's what the whole thing's about. You know, the truth of the matter is, I've heard my whole life, the main thing is to make sure that the main thing is the main thing, and the main thing is to win souls to Christ. I don't know how many times I've heard that. The main thing is to make sure that the main thing stays the main thing, and the main thing is to win souls to Christ. And I say, no. The main thing is to bring glory to God. God is glorified when people are saved. Amen. You know, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. But that's not the only thing. There are many ways to glorify God in our preaching and our service and as serving one another and in our love. Uh, the main thing is make sure that our lives and what we do, we do with the power of God. And that's what brings Him the glory. In these last days, how should we live in these last days? Oh, we're living and we're longing and we're learning and we're loving and we're loving and we're serving. Father, how we love you. And thank you for your many blessings. Dear Lord, we thank you for this portion of Scripture. Father, I thank you for how you speak to our hearts. And Lord, there's no doubt we're living in these last days. And, and soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, Lord, you're going to break through that eastern sky and you're going to catch us out of here. And Father, I just pray that you'll find us with the pedal to the metal, hammer down, glory bound. Father, I pray that you'll find us serving you walking close to you, but doing it all with the right heart. Help us, dear Lord, to have that love that we're supposed to have, one for another. Father, continue to bless us in only ways that you can. Help us to walk close to you. The devil would love nothing more than to just throw a monkey wrench in what God is doing here. Father, how I pray that you'll protect us from all the wiles of the wicked one. Continue to bless this church in Jesus' name. Shall we stand together, please? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Brother Jeremy begins to play. The invitation song has begun. The Lord spoke to your heart, friend. The altar is open. Oh, don't be afraid to use an altar. Lee Robertson used to say, don't put faith in a man who doesn't frequent the altar. I know what he means. May God help us. When God speaks, we should move.
playing page number 156. It's a wonderful song. Is your all on the altar? 156. Let's sing this first verse in the chorus. You have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control. You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. If you came prepared to give the, uh, the, the treasure box, I like the word the storehouse. <laughs> People say, well, I believe in storehouse giving. I say, I do too. It's right there in the back. We call it the storehouse. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the storehouse is there for you this evening if you came prepared to give. Let's just sing that song. We'll, uh, not we'll never sing it, by the other one. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. And we'll be on our way. Thanks for being faithful. Let's sing. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart. Since Jesus made everything right, I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven, and that's why I'm happy to. There is a sign-up sheet on the back table to help out with uh, with Brad and Myra. If you want to sign up there, that'd be great. But God bless you. Thanks for being at church tonight. You're dismissed.